Jason Carr, and today I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of corn and how we've come from Teosinte, which was grown in uh, central Mexico, to the field corn that we all know and recognize today. So there's obviously a variety of different types of corn that are on the market or are used for different things. So we have flint corn. Um, another example of flint corn is a lot of ornamentals with the colored kernels are flint corn. Uh, one type of flint corn that we're all familiar with is popcorn, which everybody likes. There's also sweet corn, and this being late in the year, as you can see, we don't have a real good example of sweet corn, but we do have some shoepag, which is a, a type of sweet corn that's grown in the southern U.S., and you can find it in the store on the shelves sometimes. The other main type of corn is dent corn, and dent corn is common field corn. Uh, there's different types of field corn. There's uh, waxy types that are used for specific food purposes and there are some other kind of uh, niche markets. Sweet corn is actually a mutation from dent corn that had a higher sugar content and was grown in the Americas starting in the 1700s. So what I want to talk about today is if we begin with Teosinte. So Teosinte is a native corn to central Mexico and it's commonly believed that this is the uh, ancestor of all of the corns that we grow today. So you can see these little uh, look like shark teeth almost kernels and they grow about eight of them in a little seed pod and they grow all up and down the stem of the teosinte. So obviously there's a big difference between that crop and this field corn that we grow today. So what I want to talk about is how we got to this point. So here we have a selection of different uh, corn varieties and hybrids from around the world. So we have things from Africa, we have corn from South America, we have corn from China, we have corn from Romania, a lot of different places around the world. And as you can see, these corns can be very different from what we have and grow today. However, these corns have important traits that have been in introduced into modern germplasm. So uh, for instance, maybe there was a disease resistance trait that we wanted to get out of this particular corn here from the Caribbean. Or, um, you know, we have an example. We have an example here of another corn from uh, tropical regions. And then we have one of my personal favorites here. This one is called Cateto, uh, which if you know any Spanish, uh, this is, it actually means hillbilly. So this is a commonly grown corn in South America used kind of, um, in the hills and you know the kind of a traditional thing so that's where its name came from but all of these would have some kind of a trait potentially that modern corn breeders would use to bring traits into our modern germplasm so they may not want you know a corn that looks like this this is actually a flint type and obviously if we're growing dent corn we don't necessarily want this hard kernel like in a flint corn however uh, breeders use a process called back crossing and so in that process you know, they have a, a modern corn that we would grow here in the Midwest, and they take this one that they identified in another country, and they cross them together. And then from that offspring, obviously, would have 50% of the traits from, from the parent that we want the traits from, and 50% from the one that we maybe only want one particular trait out of. And so then they take the offspring from that, they cross it, Back. It's, that's why it's called back crossing to the, the parent that has the traits that are most desirable and they talk, take the offspring from that and cross it back again over and over for several generations until you have uh, while maintaining the trait that you're looking for until you have a ear that looks like all of our other corn and performs like all of our other corn but maybe has a specific disease resistance that we're looking for. We start with the teosinte and I'm going to tell the story of how we come to the modern corn that we have today. So um, it, you know, over time, this would have been grown as a food crop uh, down in Mexico, the ancient Mexicans would have grown this. And over time, they would have just selected uh, maybe one that had a little more seed on it or one that had a little bit bigger seed. And, you know, that would have been obviously desirable and they would have used the seeds for that to plant next year's crop. And so that's, you know, basically what plant breeding is, is selecting the best things and then maybe mixing them with something else, but basically selecting the best things over and over until we uh, 
come to something that's very desirable. And this process has been completed for a lot of crops, but corn is a nice example because there's a big difference between the early ancestor of corn and the corn we grow today. So if we fast forward, um, obviously the, the native peoples of the Americas were growing corn for hundreds of years before the Europeans arrived. And we've all heard the story, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up here and we've all heard the story about uh, the pilgrims coming over and the Indians helping them plant corn uh, and, you know, them having a crop that first year and, and uh, being thankful for that and so on. And so that corn would have looked very much like this, what I'm, what I'm holding in my hands here. This is Longfellow. And this is um, very similar to the corn that would have been grown at that time in the Americas. And if you see here, it was grown in a very different way than how we grow today. So, you know, you're used to driving down, seeing a cornfield with nice straight rows, lots of, lots of stalks of corn in the field. Um, for this, for Longfellow, and the corn that they grew at that time, they would have planted it into hills, which were pretty far apart, that they allow them to control weeds in between the hills. They might have planted three or four seeds in a hill, and if you remember the story, they'd put a fish in with it for fertilizer. Um, they obviously were doing some of the same practices we do today, although in a very different way. Um, and so another difference, if you look at this corn compared to modern corn, you can see that it appears that there's lots of stalks here in this one spot. And actually most of these here are tillers, uh, which is something that has been selected against in modern corn. But at this time, it, you know, you think about that system, it would have been advantageous for them to have multiple stalks, each one with an ear on it, uh, to produce multiple ears of corn in, a, in that same area. So they would have used this, ground it into flour, eaten it, um, and so on. And so this was used for a long time in what is now the United States. Now if we fast forward a few hundred years, uh, we start, we have an example here of a dent corn. Now this is gourd seed. So gourd seed is a southern dent. Um, you can maybe kind of tell the plants here are very green still. So it's a very late type of uh, corn. And, but this obviously looks more like the corn that we grow today. So you can see there's some denting on the kernels. Um, it's obviously white, but it's, it's, very different from the Longfellow. So you can see the changes that were made over time. So we fast forward again another couple hundred years and it brings us to the late 1800s. And it actually brings us to Illinois. Um, this general area, central Illinois, uh, Tazewell County. And there was a man named Robert Reed. And Robert Reed had moved to Illinois from Ohio. And uh, he noticed that the varieties of corn, we're talking about varieties at this point still, so you often hear about hybrid corn, and we'll talk about hybrid corn as we move on, but basically a variety is not, the pollination is not controlled, it's open pollinated, uh, and therefore uh, it is not as uniform as the hybrids that we're, that we're familiar with today. But there were no varieties really available that, that really were as good as the varieties that he'd been growing in Ohio. So, one of those varieties might have been something like this gourd seed that we, we looked at earlier. Um, it, wouldn't have, it wasn't exactly this. Uh, it, it probably looked more like a typical dent corn. But the problem was it required a longer growing season than what he had in his new home. So his intention was to select the earliest maturing seeds out of that and push the maturity earlier so that he could have a corn that had the traits that he was used to, the performance that he was used to, and mature earlier and he would be able to plant that in his field. Well, he had a bad uh, year for planting. The corn, most of it didn't come up and he went in and replanted that field with another variety later in the year. Well, it turned out that some of those, just by chance, some of those earlier ones that he had planted came up, the longer season vari varieties, and the corn naturally cross-pollinated as corn does. And he was able to select then of those that were combined together almost by accident and develop over time with his son James a variety of corn that was very prevalent, uh, commonly grown in the United States 
in the Midwest for about 40 or 50 years. And it set yield records at the World's Fair. They continued to develop, develop it over time. They actually had a big business selling corn and selling seed corn. And some of those yields were up around 100 bushels, which was very, very high for the time. Here we have a selection of varieties of corn, open pollinated things that were developed, you know, over 100, 150 years. And, um, you know, there was some quality things here, like the Reed's Yellow Dent was, was really good for its time. Um, but one thing we can see, one of the problems we have, when we talk about varieties as opposed to hybrids, they're not very consistent. So you can see here, all these ears are different. We have different amounts of pollination on them. They probably, the ears came on at different times. If you look closely at these rows of plants, each row is a different open pollinated variety. And you can see there's big differences within the row of where the ear is on the plant. You can see differences in plant height. You can see differences in how well the plants are standing within it. So anytime we have an open pollinated variety, we're going to have a lot of variation. So as we start talking about the transition from varieties to hybrids, I want to show you one of the main reasons why we take advantage of hybrids. One is the uniformity. So in the previous example of the open pollinated material, we saw that there was a lot of difference in height, there was a lot of difference in ear placement, there was a lot of difference in the standability, there were a lot of differences. When we look at a hybrid, we get uniformity. So if you can see here down this row, the ears are basically placed at a very uh, uniform height, very standard height. And uh, you can see that the, ear, the plants themselves are pretty standard height. You can see a lot, not, there's not much variation there. And another thing we benefit we get from hybrids is something we call hybrid vigor. So in this example, this is, uh, these are two very popular inbred lines that were used to create hybrids in the 1970s. And this is uh, B73 and Missouri 17, which is a, a parent out of Missouri and a parent out of Iowa State University. They were crossed together and a lot of seed companies sold this, made small tweaks to it and sold it widely in the 1970s, the early 1970s. And this was one of the last uh, publicly developed hybrids that was sold in the United States. And so we can see here, here's an ear from B73 and one from Mo17. And here's an ear from the offspring, from the hybrid. And this illustrates something we call heterosis, uh, usually referred to as hybrid vigor. And it's the tendency of the parents to produce an offspring that is superior to either one of the parents. So as you can see here, and I could go pull any ear out of here and any ear out of the, out of the uh, parents, and you, you know, there might be a little bit of variation from this, but, but any one would illustrate this point, that the offspring, because of hybrid vigor, is much uh, more robust than the parents in many cases. So that brings us to the present day. Behind me here I have a selection of hybrids that are, are the newest and best things on the marketplace. And if, if you remember, when we looked at a lot of those open pollinated things, they were falling down, uh, they were goosenecking, some of them were standing back up, but a lot of them were lodged. And if we look at these modern hybrids, most of them are standing upright. And there's a reason for that. Um, improvements in genetics are part of it, but that's not the whole story. The main reason for the differences in standability between modern hybrids and older corn is, in addition to the improvements in genetics, is that we have a pest called corn rootworm that feeds on the plants, on the roots of the plants, and causes the roots to be weakened and the corn will then fall down and lodge and gooseneck. And this used to be a, a really big problem for years and years. Um, but the way we are combating this problem currently is through genetically modified corn with BT traits integrated into the, into the modern hybrids. So corn rootworm causes uh, over a billion dollars in economic damage uh, with the damage that it causes to the plants and the control measures that are needed to, to combat it. Um, if we look back how it was controlled in the past, a lot of these species of, of worms that attack the plants, such as corn earworms, cutworms, corn borers, rootworms, if we look back at the you know, early to mid-1900s, one of the ways they would control that pe those pests is to mix up poisons, such as arsenic, in molasses and spread them over a field. You can imagine that something like that uh, caused a lot of problems for the you know wildlife in the area 
children, pets, any, any kind of thing that would be coming into contact with that that was not a target species. So it would kill the worms that they were targeting, but it would also cause a lot of other problems potentially. Um, then we started over time, we became a little more targeted with our pesticides. Uh, you know, things that were a little bit more selective, didn't just kill everything, were a little bit safer for the handlers. Um, but there's a, a bacteria that was discovered called Bacillus thuringiensis that lives in the soil. And this was discovered many years ago. It's been used for uh, at least half a century as a control for Lepidopteran and beetle species and other insects. So this is a bacteria that lives in the soil. It infects the uh, insects and it has a protein in it that binds to their gut, pokes holes in their gut and basically causes their guts to explode and they die. And this has been used for, like I said, a long time. It's used in organic production even today. Um, it's commonly sprayed on crops um, up, up until the time of harvest even. So sweet corn is an example. Um, you know, earworms are, are a real problem in sweet corn. Uh, you know, nobody likes to shuck back an ear of sweet corn and find a worm in there. And it's messed up the tip and it's got droppings all over in there and it's just, you know, nobody likes it. You have to break it off, nobody can eat it. Um, so obviously for commercial sweet corn production, that can be a big problem. And if, you know, in, in conventional production up until, you know, uh, 20 or so years ago, they would spray pesticides for that. Um, pyrethroid insecticides mainly and they would have to spray them every three to five days. So a lot of pesticide applications. In organic production, same thing, but they didn't have access to those pyrethroid insecticides. So they would use, um, and do use, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis sprays. So they spray that bacteria on to combat the pests. So what scientists have discovered is you can take that uh, Bt bacteria and you can isolate that, the genetic sequence that codes for that production of that protein and through uh, genetic modification we can transform a, a corn plant or a different crop and we can make the plant express that protein. So the plant expresses that single protein that is when the insect target insects feed on it, it is taken in, it causes them to die and uh, you move on. Well that you know, the great thing about this is that it's harmless to people. It's harmless to other species that are not the very specific insects. In fact, there's, there's many, many Bt proteins. There's many, many strains of Bt bacteria, and each one is only effective against a specific species of insect or a narrow range of species of insects. So it's, they're very targeted. So these, this method of control is much safer than uh, you know, other methods of control that we've had in the past. And the way this is done, the way these plants are created is um, through another natural process. So we're taking a natural protein and making the plant express it itself. Um, the, the way this is done widely is through the use of Agrobacterium tumefaciens, which is another bacteria that lives in the soil. And this is a bacteria that actually uh, causes uh, crown gall in plants. It causes a disease in plants. It, it, the way it works is this bacteria has a plasmid in it that contains DNA and it injects that into the plant. The plant incorporates that into its own DNA and then it expresses the genes to make this form a gall where this bacteria can thrive and survive. And so what scientists have done is removed the disease uh, causing gene which only is, causes diseases in plants and they can put in any into the bacteria any gene that you know is desirable expose a, a few plant cells, a few corn plant cells that we're talking about here with this bacteria and the DNA that is desired is then placed into the corn genome and then we grow back whole plants from that and that process you know we can develop plants that are resistant to pests and uh, herbicides or other you know desirable traits. Uh, this is actually a process that has occurred naturally. It's uh, the first example that was identified is sweet potatoes. So sweet potatoes were found to have a gene from another species which was uh, placed there by this Agrobacterium tumefaciens. So this is actually uh, a naturally occurring process that is uh, leveraged by humans to create uh, desirable, to create plants with desirable characteristics. 
So we've talked a lot today about the history of corn, and I want to real briefly talk about the future because scientists and, and are always trying to make improvements, always looking towards the future. And this is an exciting uh, new product that hopefully will be on the market before too long. So I have here a very popular modern hybrid, and beside me is a short corn hybrid. This corn actually has a, a natural gene that was identified. This is not a biotech product. This was identified in, uh, you know, we talked about the germplasm from around the world. This was identified from somewhere else, a gene that makes the, the inner nodes actually to be shorter. By that I mean that the distance between the leaves is shortened in this corn compared to, to nat, uh, normal or commonly grown corn, standard stature corn. And I pulled an ear off of each one and you can see the ears are, are very similar. I just pulled one from this row and then one from right beside it in this row. There's really um, nothing different about the ears. This corn yields very similar to the taller corn. If you think about it, there's a lot of potential advantages to having corn be shorter rather than taller. So um, one is uh, that we have more access to this field. If you think about coming in late, uh, you know, a disease comes into the field, farmer needs to spray the field to combat that disease, um, it's a lot harder to come over the top of this corn that's a lot taller. And so, you know, there's some sprayers that, that will do that, but there's still the potential to damage some of the corn and knock some of it down. That's why you commonly see crop dusters going over fields if you live in a rural area or you drive through a rural area because of the, you know, the, the reluctance to go into that field when the corn is so tall. But if you, as you can see, this corn is, is maturing. You know, it's not going to get any taller here. It's, it's nearly mature, and as is the one on my right. And you can see this corn is much shorter than this corn. It's, it's a good foot and a half uh, to two feet shorter. Another big benefit is when we talk, you know, we talked about lodging and we talked about how a lot of the cause of that is rootworm feeding, but also the, the plant architecture, you know, if you have a great big tall uh, plant, it's more likely to fall over. So when we talk about the short corn, uh, it's less likely to lodge. It's, you know, there's a lot, the center of gravity is lower, it's less likely to fall over just from, just from general physics. So this is a very exciting product that hopes to, that hopefully will be on the market within a, a few years here and here at our sites we're really evaluating this to, to make sure that it performs like standard corn. So I appreciate your time here today. Thank you for bearing with me. I hope that you found the history of corn as interesting as I do.